Well, good morning. morning. It's good to be here, and um, I I am excited to be here. And as I shared a little bit last night, um, and this is a a very much a danger zone here. So uh, if you see me drifting over this way, just kind of be like, just give me a little like, don't do that, because I tend to go to my right, and it could be bad if I do. Um, As I said last night, uh, I'm not excited about the circumstances that led me to be here, first of all, with with Dan's battle with cancer and me being out of a church right now. But I know that although I wouldn't have chosen to go down the path that I've been down necessarily, and I know that, that Mr. Pinkham would not have chosen to go down that road, that God has allowed it and God has a purpose. And so while I'm not excited about the circumstances, I'm excited about the fact that God perfectly orchestrates our lives for His purposes. And so I'm thankful to be here this week and I'm excited to, to share God's Word with you. And as I shared last night, we talked a little bit about dress code this week, all right? So, to get things started off this morning, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a clothing battle with your parents? Anybody ever have a clothing battle? A few of you? All right. Anybody know someone who had a clothing battle with their parents? All right. I see some finger pointing. All right. For you that are parents, have you ever had a clothing battle with your kids? All right. We're kind of familiar with the clothing battle, right? You, you pick some clothes out and your parents say what? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? You're not going out of the house looking like that. All right. And we sort of have this battle and our parents have an idea of what we should be wearing and we have an idea of what we should be wearing and there's a conflict. And I think sometimes uh, we have that same conflict in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so this week we're going to be looking at some things that we should be wearing Um, And we're going to do that out of the book of Colossians. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Colossians. We're going to start there, and we're going to look at a whole bunch of passages today. We're going to move very rapidly through some scriptures this morning. But we'll be in Colossians 3 in just a minute as we talk about this idea of dress code. And as we come to the book of Colossians, Paul's writing to the church at at Colossae. And and as you read the book of Colossians, as you read away, he he very much is, is... sharing with them the sufficiency and the supremacy of Christ. And so this is, this is passionate on his heart and his mind. Chapter 1 of Colossians is fantastic verses about who Jesus is and who he is to be in our lives. And so as he talks to them about the sufficiency of Christ and the supremacy of Christ, he then in chapter 3 begins to deal with the, the fact that sometimes, although we believe in the sufficiency of Christ, we believe in the supremacy of Christ, sometimes we don't do a very good job of living it out. And so he's going to challenge the believers there to live out the reality of who Christ is in their life. To understand who they are in Christ and what that looks like. And as someone who's in Christ, we become a child of God, right? We become adopted into the family of God. That means if you know Christ as your Savior, we are all family, right? That's why there's such a great family atmosphere here because we are related to each other in Christ. We are brothers and sisters. We are children of God, which is an amazing, an amazing thing. I mean, to think about the fact that the God of the universe, the creator and the sustainer of the universe, right? And, and Paul talks about that in chapter 1 of Colossians, that Jesus is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And God has made a way for us to relate to him as a child. And that's an incredible privilege. But it also brings a responsibility. And so we're going to look at that this week, is how that responsibility should be lived out in our life. Because a lot of times, our lives don't really reflect the reality of who Christ is and what Christ has done. And God wants your life to reflect the reality of who Jesus is and what he's done in your life. And so Paul, in, in Colossians chapter 3, he uh, begins by telling them there's some thi- We knew that was a risk. So... That screen is gone. Um, thanks, Randy. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Because Christ is sufficient. <laughs> um, as he is, is in chapter 3, he's telling us, he said, there's some things in your life that shouldn't be there. And you can read about those in the beginning of Colossians chapter 3. There's there's some things in your life, he says, that that used to be part of your old life, and they shouldn't be part of your new life in Christ. But then he talks about what should be part of your life. And that's what we're going to look at this week. What should be in our lives. All right? We're going to look at what should be part of our lives in Christ. So, 
Let's look together. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul says, put on then, as God's, this is Colossians 3.12, he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. So he says, he says, as God's chosen ones, as those who have been brought into a relationship with God. He's, so he's, he's, he's building this off relationship. He says, those who are in a relationship with God, he says, you're holy, you're set apart. You're, you're to be different, and you're beloved. Isn't that an amazing thing? He says, you are the object of God's affection. And so based on your position as a child of God, based on the fact that you've been called to be set apart, and based on the fact that God loves you with this unending love, he says, based on these things, I want you to clothe yourselves with these things. So that's some pretty good motivation, isn't it? Some pretty good motivation for us to think about, why should I be interested in hearing how my father wants me to dress? Because he chose me. Right? He adopted me into his family. Right? You know, we are chosen children. God chose to have a relationship with you. He desires to have a relationship with you. He's set you apart for himself. And he loves you so much. And so he says, based on those things, here are some things that I want you to wear. And then, down in verse 14, if you look there, I want us to look at that real quickly because verse 14 really sums up all five of the things that we're going to look at because Paul says there, he says in verse 14, the most important piece of clothing that you must wear is love. For love is what binds all of us together in perfect harmony. So it's the most important thing that you're ever to clothe yourself with in this world is love. As followers of Christ, if there's one thing that we should be known for, if there's anything that the world should look at us and say, I don't know about those Christians, I'm not sure what they believe, but I know one thing, they are people who love. They love God, they love each other, and they even love me. But I don't know that that's always the reputation that we have. But Paul says the most important thing that we wear is love. And he says, love is what binds us together in perfect harmony. I know this week, the goal for a lot of you is what? To make perfect harmony. Right? That's what your teachers expect. Perfect harmony. And harmony is what? Is, is harmony pleasing to the ear? Yes. All right. Harmony is pleasing to the ear. And our lives are to be pleasing to God. And you can't make harmony alone, can you? Can you make harmony by yourself? Somebody help me out there. It's pretty hard to make harmony by yourself, isn't it? All right. We have been called as Christians not to just have a relationship with God vertically, but to have relationships with one another horizontally. And so God calls us to live life. And he says in those relationships there should be perfect harmony. And that the pathway to achieving that is being clothed in love. The five things that we're going to talk about all relate to love. They all relate to how we are to, to show and to share love. So let's look at the first one this morning, which is compassion. What do you think about when you hear the word compassion? Somebody. Anybody. Compassion International. All right. Compassion International is an organization that seeks to alleviate suffering by helping people out of poverty. Uh, I had a privilege a couple years ago, thank you for setting this up for me. Um, I had a privilege a couple years ago to going to the Dominican Republic and working at Compassion International sites. And Compassion's vision is to go into a community and to help children there get an education and come to know Christ. And so that they are spiritually connected to God, but they know that they have an education, they'll have an opportunity to move out of poverty. All right, And so they are showing compassion. They're showing compassion. Compassion, the definition of compassion is a sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. It literally, here in Colossians 3.12, comes from the, the two words that are most basically translated the bowels of mercy. All right? And that comes because way back in time, the bowels were considered to be the seat of your emotions, All right, not the heart. But when greeting cards came along, they realized that we had to change that. <laughs> All right? Are you with me? If we're going to sell any greeting cards, this whole bowels of mercy thing, you know, and just the picture, it, it just, it wasn't going to work. <laughs> All right? But it literally comes from two words, the bowels of mercy, but it's best translated the heart 
of compassion. And God desires that you and I, as his children, would be clothed or dressed literally with a heart of compassion, have genuine empathy and concern for the people in our lives who are hurting and needing. And the reason that Paul challenges these believers and us to clothe ourselves with compassion is because God is a God of compassion. He is a God of compassion. I'm always amazed at the compassion that Jesus had. Or through the Gospels and through a few different interactions that Jesus had with people. And I want you to see and feel his compassion. Okay, so let's, let's, let's do that. If you have your Bible, and I had these on slides, which we're not going to be able to see now. But Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. So you'll just have to turn with me. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 is the first one I want to look at. And it says, And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So just, just think about that for a minute. It says, as he went through these cities and villages, he was teaching and proclaiming the gospel. And as he was doing that, people were coming that were sick. That, that needed healing and needed God's touch. And it says, when he saw the crowds, he had what? Compassion. He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus' heart broke for the crowds. When he saw the hurt and the pain and the lostness and the suffering that people were going through, he had compassion on them. Which is why he did two things. He preached the gospel to them. The good news that they needed. But he also had compassion for their pain and for their hurt and for their sickness. Look in Matthew 14. Now turn over a couple pages. Matthew chapter 14. It says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now, think about this scene. Jesus has just been very busy in ministry, and he needs some time away. He needs some downtime. How many of you are introverts? All right. How many of you know that you have to just get away from people once in a while, or else you will die? All right. All right, which is great. You love being around people, but you have to have, and there's nothing, that's how God made you. There's nothing wrong with being an introvert, all right? That's, that's a good thing. It's how God wired you. It's how he shaped you. But you just know that you have to recharge by getting away once in a while. And even Jesus, in his humanity, had to get away sometimes to recharge, to spend time alone with his Father. And so in Matthew 14, he is seeking out those times. But as word gets out that he's traveling across the Sea of Galilee, it's about eight miles wide as he is sailing across that lake in a boat, the crowds find out and they beat him there on foot. And so here's Jesus. He's tired. He's looking for some time to be alone. He just needs to be refreshed. And the people need him again. And what does he do? He has compassion. Even when he was tired, even when he needed to be alone, he had compassion. Right? He had compassion on the people and he met their needs. Matthew 15, turn over a page or two. It says, Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. You know that story, right? Jesus had been teaching them. There was a large crowd, as many as 10,000 possibly. There's 5,000 men, right? And as Jesus looked on this crowd, he says, I have compassion. I won't send them away hungry. I just want you to, again, as we look through these things, I want you to be feeling and sensing the compassion that Jesus looked at people and he saw their needs. He saw their hurt. He saw their physical needs. He saw their spiritual needs. And he truly cared that those needs were met. Jesus had compassion. Keep going in Matthew. Well, Matthew chapter 20. And again, we're just skimming through these verses because what I'm wanting to do is not so much wrestle with each text, but I just want you to think and understand how much compassion Jesus had and how often the compassion of Jesus is emphasized in the Gospels. That's a little more stable. There we go. Matthew chapter 20, and uh, beginning in verse 29. Matthew 20, and beginning in verse 29. It says, And they went out of Jericho, and a great crowd followed him. 
Again, a big crowd is following Jesus. And it says, Behold, there were two blind men sitting on the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more. So here's these blind guys, and, and they're crying out for Jesus, and the crowd's telling them to just be quiet, probably using those two words that your parents say you can't use, shut up, right? They're telling us, be quiet. Don't bother Jesus. Don't make a fool out of yourself. But they cried all the more, it said. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, stopping. Jesus called to them and says, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, Lord, let our eyes be open. And Jesus, in pity, in compassion, touched their eyes. And immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Think about that scene. Jesus is traveling. There's a huge crowd. There's people everywhere. And out of this huge crowd, there's two guys that are begging Jesus, crying out to Jesus to meet their need. And he stops and he sees them and he touches them. And he meets their need. Jesus was full of compassion. Jumping over to Luke chapter 7. Just again to see the incredible compassion that Jesus had. Luke 7 verse 11. It says, Soon afterward he went into a town called Nain. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out. The only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had... Anybody want to guess? Compassion. He had compassion on her. He said, do not weep. Then he came up and he touched the buyer. And the bears stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Jesus had compassion on this dear lady who had been left in the world without a husband, without a son, with no one to take care of her. In this society, that was a huge thing because she had no way to provide for herself or to take care of herself. And Jesus saw this situation and he looked at her and he had compassion. When Jesus performed his miracles, he did so out of a compassionate heart, a heart that truly cared about the needs of the people around him. Jesus' heart broke for the single-hearted mom. He had compassion for his friends and their pain. You remember, I don't have to turn there, but John chapter 11, one of the most familiar miracles of all, right? The raising of Lazarus. And you guys remember that story? He got word that Lazarus was sick, and he sort of takes his time getting there. When he gets there, Lazarus has died. And, and at first, Martha comes out, and she says, You know, Jesus, if you had been here, right? If you just had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And, and Jesus, in compassion, looks at her and says, you know, Martha, you know that, that he's going to rise again. And she says, oh, I know that and I believe that. And he talks about how he is the resurrection and the life. But then Mary comes to Jesus. And Mary had a very different personality than Martha. And Jesus met each of them in their personality. He met each of them at the point of their need. And Mary came out with the same question. Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. And then she began to cry. And it says in Luke chapter 11 that Jesus was deeply moved. He was deeply hurt by her hurt. And he wept with her. See, he met each of them at their need. He showed compassion. I just want you to, you know, I think sometimes we, we, we develop misconceptions about who God is and about who Jesus is. And this morning, I just wanted to take you through all these passages. I know we're just skimming through a lot of them because I want you to see and feel the compassion that Jesus had. He is a compassionate God. He had compassion for the crowds, for the blind, for the broken, for the grieving. And He has compassion for us. God has shown you compassion. He is a compassionate high priest. He invites you to bring your hurt, your pain, your worries, your fears, your doubts, all of that to Him continually, anytime, because He cares. And so I want you to know, first of all, this morning, that, that God has compassion for you, and He wants you to feel and know and experience His compassion in your life. But then He wants you to clothe yourself with that compassion. He wants compassion to be something that you wear, something that you dress yourself with every day, because we live in a world where people need compassion. Distribute judgment, right? Anybody ever, maybe you didn't think of it consciously like that, but I bet some of us, right, 
have distributed some judgment before. Because we thought maybe it was our job to distribute judgment. But the Bible says in John chapter 3 that the world's already judged. The world's already condemned apart from Christ. Right? Our job is to show compassion. Jesus had compassion. His compassion led him to serve and love people and to meet their needs. And that's what our compassion needs. Our compassion isn't just something we should talk about. It should lead us to serve and meet the needs around us and to clothe ourselves with compassion. And I really think it, it, it boils down to seeing people the way God sees them. You know, we, we all see through our lenses, but God wants us to see people as He sees them. You know, and sometimes in the busyness and the craziness of life, we can rush right by the people that God places in our life. Every day there are people that God places in your life that need God's encouragement, they need His love, and they need His compassion. And He's placed you there. And He wants you to see them. It's so easy sometimes to judge. It's so easy to criticize. But when we're clothed with compassion, we'll begin to see people for who they are. And we'll begin to see past the surface. Maybe the reason they did something that you didn't like was because they have a lot of hurt in their life. Maybe they have a lot of pain in their life. Maybe they need compassion. Maybe they're lonely. And so I want to challenge you this week to, to practice compassion and to think about compassion. Because this shouldn't just be something we talk about, right? It should be something that we do. Because we get really good at talking about it in the Christian life, but sometimes we never get past the talking about it and the theorizing to the actual doing. And so I want to ask you to, to say, how can I practice compassion this week? I want you to think about what are some ways that you can practice compassion with each other, maybe with the staff here at Houghton? S seek to practice compassion. Ask and say, God, show me somebody today that I can show your compassion to. Just a real quick example before we close. A great way to start. Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Very simple verse, but it says this. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It's a great way to practice compassion. It's a great way to do what God has called us to do. How many times when uh, we've been commanded to rejoice with somebody who's rejoicing, how many times when somebody's telling you something great that happened to them, you're sort of thinking, mm, do I have a story that's a little bit better than that? <laughs> right? Like somebody tells you, oh yeah, this something great happens, and then either you want to tear it down a little bit, or you want to then say, yeah, oh, that's great, but this happened to me, or we... We don't just stop and say, you know, I am really genuinely happy for you and rejoice with them. So I want to challenge you. Maybe you could do this with your roommate, maybe with a friend here. Ask them about something that's happened in their life recently that's really great. And then to be genuinely happy for them and rejoice with them about that. Celebrate that. And then maybe you can practice that second part where it says weep with those who weep. Maybe you'd be willing to say, hey, has there been something in your life that's, that's been hard lately? Something in your life that's been difficult? And take time just to enter their world. You know, we get so busy in life with our world, don't we? There's, a, there's an innate tendency in all of us as human beings to be focused on ourselves more than others. And we're going to get to that when we talk about humility. But when we practice compassion, we're beginning to think that it's not just about me. Jesus showed us how to live a life of compassion. He is our model. The great thing about talking about dress code this week and these things that, that Paul says we're to wear is that Jesus modeled every one of them for us. He wore them. He didn't just talk about them. He didn't just teach about them. He lived it out. He showed us how to practice compassion. And so I want to challenge you this week to clothe yourself with compassion. Not just this week, but for all of your life. But you have to start now. You have to start practicing it. So today, I want you to seek someone out that you can practice compassion on and show compassion to. And it really comes down to this. Are you going to have a clothing battle with your Father in Heaven? Because we, we're going to look at these things and there's going to be some pushback when we come to some of them because we don't necessarily want to wear them because not all the things that we're going to look at this week are going to be fashionable in the world's eyes. Not all the things that, that Paul's going to tell us to clothe ourselves with are what the culture says that we should wear. And we have a tendency to want to be like the culture and Jesus calls us to live differently. And so my challenge for you today and this week is don't have a clothing battle with your Heavenly Father. Don't fight Him. Trust Him, because He chose you, He set you apart, and He loves you with a love that's greater than you'll ever understand. 
And that's the motivation for doing what He's called us to do. So let me pray for you this morning. Father, I thank You for this opportunity that we have this week to, to be together. Father, I thank You for this group that You've assembled. I thank You for their lives. I thank You for their talents, their abilities. I thank You for the love that You have for each of them. Father, I pray that this week that, that they would be able to experience You and to know You in a great way. I pray that as they uh, experience music together and life together, Father, that You would grow them, sharpen them, challenge them. But Father, I pray that most of all in each of our lives, Father, that You would accomplish Your will and Your purpose. And Father, I pray that we would learn to dress the way that You call us to dress. And Father, so that we can reflect the heart and the characteristic of Jesus to this world. Father, I pray that we would seek today to show compassion. Show us that person that we can share Your compassion with. And Father, we ask for Your grace to do it. In Jesus' name, Amen.